All right, so let's sort of officially get things started now. Um, and again, if you're all here for Emerging Technologies for Online Teaching, you're in the right spot. So welcome again. Um, we will have two presenters today. Um, Stephanie Richter is our Assistant Director in the Instructional uh, Faculty Development Instructional Design Center. Um, she's going to be joining us a little bit later. My name is Tracy Miller, and I'm the Online Teaching Coordinator here in Faculty Development. So we do have some objectives for our workshop this afternoon. And what we're hoping is that you will discover some emerging technologies um, really specific to online teaching and learning. Um, and we've kind of broken things down into some different categories in how to create content, how to enhance your communications, um, and also how to foster collaboration with your students in an online course. Um, so hopefully we meet these objectives. We have a few other things thrown in um, as a little fun. When we originally thought about this um, workshop, um, we considered calling it um, cool technology, fun technology. Um, so sit back and relax a little bit this afternoon because we're going to introduce you to some new things. Um, but we're really hoping that you just kind of get a smorgasbord of some of the new technologies that out, are out there. Um, and what do I mean by emerging and new technologies? Um, some of them are new. And some of them are new to us. Um, it all kind of depends on um, where you fit on that scale of um, you know, really trying new things, exploring new things, always looking out for the, you know, the next thing, or whether you rather kind of sit back and let others figure it out a little bit and um, kind of jump on a little bit later. Um, so again, some of these things you might have heard of, seen of before, but um, hopefully there's some things that I can introduce you to. And some new ways of doing old things. Yes, Stephanie, good information. Um, so just as an introduction to the workshop today, um, we're really talking about quality online teaching. Uh, and you know, for the last year and a half or so, we've really been putting an emphasis on quality in online teaching and learning. And uh, we've done several workshops on design. And we've done a few now on delivery. This one in particular, I think you're going to find that it's going to address a little bit of both. And because we're talking about emerging technologies, um, consider it something that this semester, now that it's really rolling, you might try some of these things um, and then maybe incorporate it into your design for the next time after you've tried it out a little bit. So that's why this one's a little bit different. Um, there's a little bit of a blend here. Um, so um, some of my thoughts on emerging technologies, and you're going to hear me kind of mention it throughout. Um, one of the things is that you're going to get excited. I hope you're going to get excited this afternoon about some of the things I introduce you to. But remember that you're looking for solutions to things that um, problems, issues that you're trying to solve in your online course right now. And so don't get too excited about the technology and try to kind of retrofitted into your course, make sure it's something that addresses a solution that you're looking for. Next, if you're trying something new, start with something low stakes. So make sure it's not something that's um, going to take over your semester, that's going to be really hard for the students to be able to learn or incorporate, or something that's going to really interfere with their grades. Because we're just kind of trying things. We're just kind of testing things right now. So with that in mind, the other thing that should be going on in your mind when you're talking about bringing new technology into your online course is to think about the cost versus the impact to you or to your students. And um, you know, as you're trying this, you're going to be looking at um, you know, first the cost. So we think about the financial cost. A lot of the technologies I'm going to show you this afternoon um, are free. Um, some of them have some sort of add-on features, upgrades that have costs associated with them. Um, and that's because that it, um, it really helps us explore a little bit more. Um, 
but we're starting off with um, some really low cost risks. Also, cost in your time um, and your kind of learning curve for you and for your students. Um, but then we really want to make sure that there's going to be um, some level of impact for your students. And so especially if you're thinking about something that's going to have a cost, again, either dollars or um, sort of a learning curve, you want to make sure that there's some going to be a real benefit or impact to your course and to your students. So I, I kind of like this um, chart with the quadrants. And it kind of, um, I like to think about it in the back of my mind. OK, um, you know, this is something that's going to be low cost, high impact. That kind of fits into that, that awesome category. Um, and you just know that it's going to work really well for your course. Um, you know, and then we've got the opposite extreme, where something's high cost, but it's really not going to have um, good impact for the, the course or for your students. So that's something you want to avoid then. And again, not do it just because everyone's doing it. Someone told you it was amazing. Um, you want to think about that when you're looking at some emerging technologies. So with all that in mind, I'd like to start a little bit about talking about some technologies that I found that will really help you um, just bump up creating your content in some ways. And like Stephanie said earlier, some of these are, are old ways, old tools in new ways. And so one of those is uh, videos. And so I think many of us, uh, that are especially experienced in online teaching, um, we use videos in our courses. We use videos in our face-to-face -face courses. So I'm going to show you some tools that um, are just going to, again, and kind of enhance that and bring that content sort of beyond just um, viewing a video. Um, we're going to talk about ways you can add some interaction to your videos. Um, I think a lot of times we're concerned that when we show our students videos, again, either face-to-face -face or online, that they're there, but maybe they're kind of checking out, they're not paying attention. And so being able to add some interactions into your videos um, hopefully keeps them engaged and, and helps them move along um, with the videos that they're consuming. Um, and then finally, freehand demonstrations. Um, we've been getting this question in some of our webinars recently um, where folks want to know if there's some way that they can kind of just kind of sketch things out for their students. Uh, I think it's pretty typical in mathematics where um, sort of very used to um, drawing out formulas and kind of working out solutions. Um, it definitely anything that we're going to use a diagram on. And some of them are just more comfortable kind of like you know, we can't find that, that perfect picture of that first diagram. So we just kind of want to freehand and um, create some content with our students that way. So let's get into it. This is going to be the fun part. Um, again, kind of just add your questions to the text chat area. Um, I'll try to pause at different times and um, answer them. I've also got Stephanie here and some other colleagues. Um, that can jump in. And don't be afraid to um, interact with each other. So if you've got an idea or if you want to kind of respond to someone in the text chat area, feel free. So my first one, I want to inspire you to get out from behind your desk, get out of your office, and use your um, readily available video camera, your mobile device. Um, it's so easy now to be able to use your mobile device and be able to deliver some kind of content to your students um, kind of out there where real things are happening. Um, in this picture right here, this is actually uh, me in San Antonio, and I'm in front of the Alamo. And so if I was um, history faculty and I wanted to um, go over some content with my students about the Alamo, what a better way than to actually 
I had that opportunity to sort of bring them there and add my voice um, to this video and kind of almost like a documentary, walk them through and, and give them my thoughts and feelings on, on what's taking place. Um, when I was in San Antonio at the Alamo, I discovered that behind the, the building there that's in front of us, there is a beautiful garden. So if I was a um, biology professor and I wanted to talk about the flora and fauna of central Texas, um, you know, I could create a video on the spot and kind of, again, add my voice to it, add my feelings to it, and be able to do that. So again, hopefully this is inspiration for you to take that um, smartphone that you have, that instant video camera, and um, be able to, to deliver content in that way. And then, you know, the, what you can do now, what's different, is that it's so easy to um, upload a video to YouTube, and then you can edit it out. So if you're um, creating content and you suddenly realize that you've just taken about 60 seconds of your feet because you weren't counting, pointing the camera in the right direction, you can go ahead and edit that out. It's, it's become much easier to do. So my next one is actually a technology um, that maybe you haven't um, explored yet, but you probably heard of the TED videos, the TED Talks, and uh, maybe even use them in your courses with your students um, because they are often um, you know, experts delivering this great content. But what TED has done now is they've added this TED Ed um, lessons worth sharing. And so you can take any YouTube video, any TEDx video, and you can add your own interactions to them. And so I've created this screenshot of what I've sort of did to one of my videos. And we archive all of these workshops. And so um, a while back, I did this best practices for delivering an online course. And anyone can go back and watch it. And again, they might watch it, and they might just kind of um, passively check their email at the same time. So what this TED Ed does is it allows me to insert really easily um, some interactions in here. And then not only will it add these interactions to it, but then the students can, if I create a question, they can go ahead and answer that question. Um, in the some of the other areas where it says um, dig deeper, um, I might be asking them to kind of you know, reflect back on what they just viewed in this video. And it's going to allow them to kind of really interact with it and um, hopefully kind of get more engaged as they're walk watching the video. But that's not the only benefit to using TED-Ed. Um, you can also walk, view the results of what the students have said. And so you can go back there and see how they answered those questions and um, what they were thinking um, when you were delivering this piece of content. And so that's like the real magic. But I do want to add some cautions, because you don't want to think of it as an assessment. This is something that's keeping them engaged while they're watching the content. It's also a way that they can um, let you know if there's some kind of misconceptions that are out there or something that they're struggling with. Is there a question that they're, um, they seem to they're not getting the answer correct on. And that's something that you can go back and um, refine, give them more content, supply them with more resources, because you're realizing that as they're watching this, they're kind of struggling with something. Or um, maybe they're just cruising through and they're getting this. So you know, move on to a, a, a different content. And you know, that's, to me, the real magic behind it. Um, I said it was an assessment, and it is not. It, this is something that you can definitely link in, in your learning management system or here at NIU um, with Blackboard. Um, but it's not something that's going to sync up, and you know it's not going to automatically 
grade it, you do um, select right answers in it, but again, it's not going to sync up and um, become something that's gradable for you. Again, it's used for you to create an interaction um, in, when you're creating content. Um, TED-Ed requires you to create an account and for your students to create an account. So that's just a little something about the tool that you might want to consider. Um, but I have an alternative for you also to consider. Um, it's similar. It's called Zaption. And again, it's just taking a, a video that you created or you found and allowing you to add some um, questions. And the reason this is kind of um, dark here is because it kind of darkens it when a question pops up on the screen. Um, the screen you're looking at right here is actually a screen in shot of it in Blackboard. So it was kind of nice that I was able to use an embed code and um, just add this right to um, Blackboard where the students can view it right from there. It seemed to work pretty well. Um, but again, they can kind of just go through and answer questions and it's collecting a lot of information on the back end for you. And so what I think is um, some benefits if it's a benefit to you with Zaption, is students don't need to create an account. Um, you can just kind of allow, you know, give them access to it and allow them to enter the space. Um, so if it is something where you want to know the results of specific users, one of the first questions you want to ask them is um, what their name is. So you can kind of make those connections. Um, but Zaption has some really good lesson analytic tools. And that's going to allow you to realize, um, again, where, um, how long students are watching it. Um, are they skipping ahead a lot? Um, that's one of the, the analytics. So if you're, if you're worried that they're kind of clicking on it, but how long are they really watching it? Um, are they moving past all the important parts? Those analytics are going to give a lot of that information um, to you. Um, and Stephanie's going to talk about some of the trends later on, but measuring the, the students um, and what they're, they're learning um, is kind of one of those emerging trends that are coming out. Um, there is a Zaption Pro. And there's a cost associated with that. Uh, that's going to give you more analytics. It's also going to allow you to um, download the results into kind of a spreadsheet. So if that's um, something that you are interested in, and of course getting some more features, um, then consider um, Zaption Pro. Quick look at it, it looked like it was about um, $45 a year for a subscription. So something to think about. Any questions on this, um, this way of kind of making your presentations a little bit more active? I'm going to pause just for a second here to see if you have any questions, any thoughts. Um, does this sound like something that would be valuable to your students? Any thoughts? Kimberly, do you have something? Yeah, I didn't know if we were supposed to talk, and so I was looking for the chat. Um, <laughs> I think this would be amazingly helpful, so thank you for talking about it. And awesome. Sharing. Thank you. OK. Kimberly, if you want to hit that microphone button again to mute it, that way if um, you have anything else to say, you can just turn it back on. Stephanie said, we're planning more info on using video in our Teaching with Technology Institute in June. So keep your eyes open for that, yes. And that also reminds me that um, this is not a hands-on workshop. And I know sometimes it can be frustrating because you just kind of want to dig in there and play with it. Um, we're kind of giving you a lot of information. But at the Teaching with Technology Institute, there will definitely be opportunities to kind of play around. And it will definitely be more hands-on. So keep that in mind. Uh, the next one is the idea of 
um, this freehand drawing kind of concept. And so what I have here for you today, I feel like a um, Food Network chef. What I have for you today is EduCreations. And EduCreations is sort of this blend of um, a whiteboard and a screencast. And um, it can be used uh, on your desktop or on a, a computer, but um, it's kind of hard to draw with a mouse. The best way is to use it on a mobile device like an ad, uh, iPad or um, a Android device or something like that. But what you do is you pick, pick a picture, an image, um, you know, some a diagram that you found, and you load it onto this platform, and then it records your voice and your um, your motions on the screen. And so you can kind of draw on there. You can kind of point things out. And so while you're doing that, it's creating um, the screencast or there's video of what you're doing. And so again, picture that um, kind of flow of watching. Um, you draw on a board and you're creating this video of this and it's just kind of unfolding for your students um, and then you once you've captured it then you can go ahead and um, give your students access to it and so you know here's the benefits they're going to watch this unfold um, you're going to very naturally be um, talking and adding to the diagram um, but they can watch it over and over again, and they can know where to find it. Um, some of the other, um, Stephanie's adding some other tools, Show Me and Lenzo. Um, some of the downsides is that you really can't edit it. So um, if you kind of flubber halfway through it, um, you're going to kind of need to start over again. Um, flubbering is OK. I think you've done it in front of a blackboard. Um, or a whiteboard, not Blackboard, the LMS, but an actual old chalkboard. Um, but you know, if you do kind of really, oh no, that's not what I meant to say, you have to go back and start over again. It's really meant for sh um, short instructional videos. So um, you know, this is not something that you're going to do an hour-long lecture. Um, Mike says, do you allow, does it allow you to export the video? Um, can you use it with TEDx and Zaption? You are, you are already thinking. You are thinking. Um, yes, there are different ways um, to export it. Um, I don't know if there's, I, I think you can send it out to YouTube. And then if you do that, then um, you, know, you can go ahead and, and integrate all those other tools with it. Um, there is. Um, a pro, so that's a paid for version, um, education pro, and that will allow you to have um, a multi-page experience. So this is not something that's going to work if you um, are kind of moving through a PowerPoint. You stick to one image and you kind of work with that image. You can erase it. So if you wanted to erase all of your markings on there and kind of start over again, you can do that. But you need the pro in order to use a multi-page document. Um, also, you get about 50 megabytes of cloud storage space. Um, so that's a lot, but it's limited. And Stephanie's giving some information about um, exporting it. OK, we're going to switch to gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about some tools that I discovered for um, enhancing communications. Um, again, we're going to talk about sort of an old tool used in new ways with video messages. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the Blackboard Student App. So here we go again. Got the smartphone out. Um, Similar to what I said before, just a different um, thought about it is uh, you can communicate with your students um, from anywhere at any time now. Uh, mobile technologies, it's a really great way to do that. Um, it kind of gives you that um, I'm a real person, you know. Um, so if you are interested in doing more communication on the go, Go ahead. I know you got a selfie stick for Christmas. I did. Pull it out. Create your videos. Create your messages to your students. Um, and um, 
maybe find a meaningful place uh, to do that that will, again, let them know that you're not just stuck behind your desk, that um, you, know, you can be out there. Now, some of these tools, you're going to say, well, can my students use them too? Absolutely. So if your students want to communicate with you, um, let them use their, uh, their phones and their mobile devices, um, whether that's responding to a, um, an assignment or some content. Um, what they need to do is just create a video of themselves and then um, upload it. Um, it's one button to upload it to YouTube, and then they can um, you know, connect it anywhere else. So again, kind of a, maybe an older technology, maybe you can think about it in a new way. Um, and of course, going back to what, what Mike said, you can then use those um, videos and maybe create some kind of interactive experience or who knows, draw all, all over them with a um, with an, kind of a uh, freehand solution like EduCreations. Um, so the next communication idea is to use the student app, the Blackboard student app. And some of you might have introduced your students or you've used the Mobile Learn app. This is just kind of a um, new version. It's got a new look. It's got a new feel. Um, it's meant to be um, what students maybe are a little bit more used to. Um, but I consider it a great communication tool. I con consider it as a tool of a way for your course to communicate with the students. Um, and so one of the ways they can do this is you'll see on the screen it says um, needs attention. And so that's going to allow the students to have this activity st stream, is what they call it, of upcoming assignments, upcoming due dates, um, anything that you're going to add in there that has a due date. So the important part is to actually add those due dates, add those calendar dates in there. Uh, so again, your course can kind of communicate with their, your students and allow them to know what's coming up. Um, students can use this to ch check their grades. Um, I always consider grades a way of communicating with students because you're letting them keep track of their progress and you're giving them feedback. And so again, this is just an easy, on-the-go kind of way to communicate with them. Um, if you are going to um, maybe introduce this to your students, make sure they know that. So say, hey, there's this new thing. Would you like to try the BB Student app? Um, here's some information on it. Um, here's a great way to check your grades. Um, you know, that's a piece of the communication, too, where you're going to let your students know that this technology is now, now available for their use. Um, you can also join a Blackboard Collaborate session using the BB Student app. And right now, that's the solution for the Blackboard Collaborate Ultra that we're using this afternoon. They keep adding new features onto it. Um, I think everybody's really enjoying kind of this new, fresh look of Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. And so if you'd like to connect with these sessions, mobily now, then you can also get the student app and um, connect that way. So I'm going to pause again for um, any questions or comments that you have on this. And thanks again, Stephanie, for kind of um, controlling the what's going on in the text chat area. We've got a lot of folks in here today. And so um, it's kind of hard to, to See how the chat is streaming along, but it looks like people are giving some input. So any other tools that you'd like to share that you've used recently for communicating with your students, we'd love to hear about it. WebEx, yes. Yes, a good web conferencing tool. Thank you, Megan. Well, continue to add to the text chat area, but I'm going to talk about collaboration um, and fostering collaboration and some new tools that I found that can really help with collaboration. Um, 
And they kind of unfold in a couple different ways. One is um, some ways to enhance um, teamwork or some project-based projects. And also um, maybe a way you can um, connect quick, easily, and efficiently um, with some of these new tools that I discovered. And um, there's just a couple of them. Uh, but the first one is Trello. Um, we've talked about Trello in some faculty development um, programs in the recent past. Um, we actually had an entire workshop on Trello. Uh, but I'm going to kind of maybe introduce it to some folks that haven't heard about it yet. But it's this organize everything um, platform. It's a cloud platform. Um, again, another free tool um, with um, some other upgrades. Um, but basically, what I'm suggesting here is this would be a really great tool for your students that are working in teams or groups. And they have a project in which they sort of need a space um, to kind of keep everything and to interact with each other. And some of the tools I like in Trello um, include um, the ability to kind of break things down into um, sizable chunks. And what they call them here, they call them cards. And so um, you can create, in this instance, I've created a card which is all about outline. You know, one of the first steps that you do when you um, create a, a time, a team project. Um, you know, you're going to outline what do you want to accomplish in this project, um, maybe even who's going to do what, um, what's the timing for it. And so I've created an outline card. Um, some of the features I like is that you can create labels. Um, in this case, it, it's color coding. The label is a red because the due date, which I've added the due date here, is today. And so the red is kind of symbolizing, ah, you know, it really needs to be in today. Um, the students can comment with each other, and that will stay right in, t in this environment. They can also um, attach different documents to this environment, um, whether they attach it using their computer or some other um, tools that we use to kind of um, connect with each other, like a Google Drive document. Um, if you use Dropbox, um, you know, uh, folks will often share files using Dropbox because then you don't end up with that kind of multi-version that you do if you're emailing things back and forth. Um, or even OneDrive that, that we've been using a little bit more here at NIU. So um, Megan says, I'm guessing this can be done just as a reminder for one person, correct? Yes, so if you, uh, what you do is you invite um, members to it. So if you just invited um, one member to a, a specific thing, you could just do that. Or if you add um, information into it and you use an at and you add that one particular member, that's something that's going to um, kind of define it for that one certain purpose. Um, you can also add checklists. And that, that kind of makes me think of it, Megan, because Checklists, you know, let's say um, you've created this checklist and you've assigned different um, components of it to different people. You're going to assign it using that at symbol. Um, and then the, the student that's in that group can kind of check it off when they're done. And again, they can all kind of enter this environment and see this information together. Um, Stephanie said it also works well for you to organize yourself if you aren't collaborating. Yes, I have uh, these um, Trello boards um, for some of my own projects and it definitely helps keep me organized. Um, what I'm thinking about that you can do as a faculty member is you can set up boards um, for a project like this for your students and invite them into it um, maybe by their groups um, and then maybe even set up some templates for them. So um, at the very corner, you can see it says to be done. I've organized this particular board into things that are to be done, um, you're currently doing, and that, that you're also done with. And then you, know, you can help start 
the students on this project with this template. Maybe even fill in some of these due dates for them um, to kind of help your students um, keep on track that way. Okay. So the next one, a um, colleague introduced this to me. It's called Telegram. And um, the best description I have for it is kind of text mes messaging and email um, put together. It's free, open source, very secure. And so um, students can get into small groups. This is the way I've been told it works well with the um, small groups. And they can um, message each other quickly, efficiently, securely. Um, but the advantage of uh, like beyond a text message is that you can attach documents. Um, you can see some of the options here, um, videos, documents. If you um, want to attach a document, again, it's going to pop open those other sharing services like Google Drive and Dropbox. Um, so that's some advantage that you don't have in text messages. Um, but it, it's um, you can form groups. Um, and that's going to kind of keep all of your messages and all of your documents contained into that kind of group environment. Um, you can also create a channel, um, which is supposed to be used for broadcasting um, to a much wider audience. Um, up to 200 people. Now I've heard they have what they call a super group, um, which may be even up to a, a thousand people. And um, you know, you can come up with your own applications for um, why a student might want to broadcast something to a thousand people, um, but you know, maybe that's that's part of their challenge of their um, project is to be able to communicate it to a large audience. Um, when I was kind of uh, looking over my notes this morning, kind of collecting things, um, I found out that Telegram has um, kind of a new companion app, which is called Entegram, E-N-T-E-G-R-A-M. And if you invite Entegram to your telegraph um, experience here, um, it will allow you to sync with one of the options is Trello. So Trello will be able to add messages to this instance of Telegram. And so um, what would that look like? So if you had a due date come up or if someone just attached a uh, particular document to their project in Trello, it would actually send a message to this group using Telegram. So again, we're kind of blending some of these technologies. And I think that is a big part of how um, these new emerging technologies are working. They're starting to really um, integrate themselves. And, um, and that's the power of some of these new technologies. Um, some of the cautions are that, you know, especially with a, a free um, service, you never know when they're going to disappear. Um, I've, a couple of these that I found um, seem to be pretty stable, again, pretty secure. Um, a lot of them are being funded um, by philanthropists. And so that's why you're not going to see a, a lot of those ads and stuff pop up, which is kind of a nice advantage, too. Um, some of the other ones I just want to throw out there for you to explore. You can see on this slide here. Um, I found that these do have a little bit more of a cost to them a little bit earlier than the ones I've already introduced. Like they might have a trial version, um, but then they it you know expects some kind of um, payment in that. So again, again, you really want to weigh that cost versus the impact for your students. Um, but here they are, kind of just in a quick list. Um, UCU. Um, it's used for allowing you to provide rich feedback on presentations. So again, you could be watching a presentation that your students have created and insert your own um, feedback into the presentation um, so that they know um, maybe a, an exact moment in time um, where they could um, stand, have some improvement in their presentation. 
Um, so you can see their tagline, record, share, interact, and learn. Um, yeah, Stephanie's adding UCU allows your students to give you feedback. Yes, so it's a two-way street. A lot of these things um, can be used um, by you and for you and with your students. Um, Quizlet. Quizlet is a way that um, you can create these kind of interactive quizzes. Um, your students can also create these um, Quizlets. Um, one of the ways that I thought was kind of interesting is they can create flashcards. So if they want to come up with flashcards um, for a study activity and then they kind of want to quiz themselves on it, um, they can use Quizlet and then they can kind of, that's, that's where their, uh, the tracking goes into play where they can see what kind of questions they seem to be missing and struggling with. And so um, that's something that you can introduce them to or um, just allow them, kind of tell them about it and let them try it out and track their own progress. Um, some of these last ones maybe are more discipline specific, but I thought they were pretty interesting. History, where you can create interactive timelines. Um, it's a nice blend of pictures and videos and thoughts and ideas. And um, it just kind of um, almost creates this interactive uh, movie where you can kind of click on different components um, and explore different things. And again, even in creating them, um, that could be something that students provide back to you. Um, the University of Wisconsin-Madison has created this case scenario critical reader builder, in which case you can build um, scenarios. By the way, all of these, um, if you just kind of um, do a Google search for these tools, they have things that have already been created. And so um, not only could you be creating them, using them, your students can be, but there may be something that's already created by another educator that you can now use with your students. So there's a couple of these case scenarios that are out there, um, but I think they're looking for more, um, depending on different disciplines again. Um, Inkle Writer, this is where uh, you or your students can create interactive stories. And um, maybe they're telling a story about um, how their a project unfolded for them. Maybe they're talking about an internship that they've experienced. Um, or maybe they're really just creating an interactive story where um, it's based off of content that they've been exploring or maybe more of a creative writing interactive story builder. Um, so again, check these out if they're kind of um, They've got you excited. See if it fits in your discipline. But remember, make sure it's something that you're looking for a solution for. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Stephanie. She's going to talk a little bit about the emerging trends that have been coming out lately. So take it away, Stephanie. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, in this section on trends, I really want to sort of push a little further. So moving from products that are out there now and are being used as, as these emerging technologies, really looking at what's coming down the road still, uh, what's maybe being experimented with, or uh, what's emerging in the workplace that could be reflected in your classroom as well. Uh, the trends, by the way, come from the 2016 Horizon Report, which if you haven't seen, we'll include a link um, in the follow-up, or maybe Tracy could add a link in the text chat. Uh, and every year, the New Media Consortium releases a horizon report of trends and issues in the world of higher education and technology, as well as the um, their predictions for what technologies are coming down the road on a near horizon, sort of a medium horizon, or a long-term, say, five-year plus horizon. So the first trend that I want to talk about, and I'll, I'll bring in some tools to support this as well, is blending formal and informal. This goes uh, for within your classroom. We've been for a long time talking about blending online and face-to-face um, -face instruction into a blended or hybrid course format. Well, for 
here, blending formal and informal learning, really is about being more deliberate and more strategic about how we blend the informal learning that students have either acquired prior to coming to the institution or acknowledging and, and making use of the informal learning that they engage in while they're here through co-curricular activities, internships, or um, social activities if they're part of an organization, for example, um, what they learn as part of that and, and helping them achieve recognition and uh, integration between that and their formal learning. So the tools for this are uh, still kind of emerging. The first one on the right in the foreground is just a portfolio tool. There's nothing really emerging about portfolios, to be honest. Uh, they've, we've used portfolios for literally years, decades, centuries, uh, as a uh, compendium of student work. However, for us here at NIU, this is somewhat of an emerging practice because we now have a campus-wide portfolio platform, which we did not have before. There were some areas on campus that used um, proprietary tools, and there were a lot of groups on campus who were constructing portfolios with paper um, and binders and creating these large formal um, but physical documents. So now through uh, the, the new Blackboard portfolio tool that's integrated directly in Blackboard, students can build portfolios uh, based uh, in that platform so it's comfortable and familiar. They can submit them to courses for grading. You can use rubrics to review them. And students can use their um, artifacts they've already submitted to assignments in their courses to add to their portfolios. So if you haven't looked at it, I highly recommend taking a look at the Blackboard Portfolio tool. I put a URL in the text chat here to our documentation on portfolios. So you can explore and see what it's like and how it works. We'll hold workshops on it, or you can contact us and, and come in to talk to us about them and we'll give you a good demonstration. But as I said, this is not a new practice, but it is a new emerging tool, at least here at NIU. Behind the portfolios, the um, cooler, newer <laughs> little brother of portfolios are digital badges. Digital badges are akin to the badges that you would have earned in Scouts if you were a, a girl or boy scout, for example, um, where they recognize discrete knowledge uh, or skills in particular areas. Badges can be awarded for uh, very large domains or for very small mastery of specific topics. Um, here I'm actually picturing the badges that are in Blackboard, uh, but there are many other platforms that are available. And so essentially you as the instructor, as the faculty member, when students have demonstrated some sort of skill or knowledge in your courses, you can recognize them with a badge. And then the, the power of this is that they can blend, they can combine the badges that they've earned through your formal education with badges that they earn through informal experiences, whether that is participating in an organization, attending a, a hackathon, visiting a museum, etc. So there are a wide variety of ways for students to earn those badges, both formal and informal, and then they retain control and access over those so that really they are controlling their presence and the way that they um, portray themselves and what they have learned in totality between formal and informal learning. Um, Katie, just to, to expand upon your question around the portfolios for students and whether they're able to retain it after they graduate, for the Blackboard portfolios, as Tracy said, students will lose access to Blackboard, their portfolio will remain active. So they can generate a link for their, their portfolio and continue to use that to share that with prospective employers or other institutions. If they want to continue editing it, they'll need to export it before they graduate and then edit it using HTML. So it gets a little cumbersome, unfortunately. But they, may, they can retain access to the portfolio that they've published so they can continue to use that. And honestly, I would say in most cases for students, 
their the portfolio that they create when they finish their degree is really only going to be useful for them in a job search for maybe three to five years before they really need to have updated it with new new artifacts and new tools. So by that point, it's probably more beneficial for them to have it in a, a system that's not tied to their alma mater. So it really becomes something they own as a professional. So the, the answer is yes and no <laughs> to a limited extent. The second trend that I want to address is measuring student learning. Uh, so here, this is going beyond a, a straight assessment uh, of student learning and really looking at measuring as many aspects of a student and of their achievement as possible. So this looks at uh, gathering data, as much data as possible in some cases, and integrating that data across platforms and across courses so that students are, uh, so that as an institution, we can look at the features and attitudes and behaviors of students that are correlating with high quality learning, and so that students can control their data and that students can access and view how they are doing and sort of take ownership of their experience and of their trajectory based on that information. So in most cases, this is going to look like some sort of a, a data or dashboard. This is an emerging tool. This is not a tool that we have at NIU currently, but it is one that we should have as soon potentially as May. This is a competency dashboard or a goal dashboard. Uh, one, well, trend again, as a new pedagogy is competency-based education or CBE. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with it, but it's definitely gaining notoriety at a variety of institutions where students are not only, are, are more than they're graded on a particular course, they're graded on the specific skills or goals, the competencies that they're expected to achieve throughout their degree. Most of the time, in fact, ideally all of the time, those competencies are then aligned with either uh, workplace or uh, graduate school expectations for what those students will leave with. So this goal-based dashboard, goal dashboard here, lets you or the student view their progress on specific competencies or goals based on the, the data that's collected from their assignments submitted in Blackboard. This tool, as I said, is not available currently at NIU, although it is a current tool available from Blackboard. And it's something that we hope to uh, upgrade to the version of Blackboard that supports this as of May. Um, that's tentative. This is, in fact, the first time we've even mentioned it publicly. So do please stay, um, stay connected for updates on that. So no guarantee we'll get this in May, but we're hoping to have this in May. Another example of that that goes a step further, this would be for an instructor view. These are fake students, just so that you know, we're not showing you student data. This is a new analytics tool, and this is highly, um, highly tentative. This is something Blackboard is working on developing that won't be available here at NIU for probably a number of years. But here, this graph of grade versus activity is trying to show a correlation between students' achievement and the amount of activity they're spending in a course. So based on this, you can see there's somewhat of a relationship. As the instructor, you can see who, um, who perhaps is outperforming and who maybe needs to be encouraged to be more active and hopefully also have a correspondingly increased grade. The student view of this would anonymize all of the scores so you wouldn't see the students' names but the student would be able to see where they fall in the pack and thus both empowering students to, with that information so that they can change their behavior perhaps and so that they can see how they are relating to their peers. And then my final example is, is a very pie in the sky, just beginning to experiment with it at various institutions. And that is measuring not only students learning in the classroom or in a course, but also their overall uh, 
health and activity levels. So a number of institutions are beginning to actually track students using Fitbits or other wearable devices and to incorporate that information into models looking at student retention, student achievement, and uh, general involvement. So again, these experiments are just beginning at a variety of institutions and it's not something we're doing here, but it is an emerging trend of looking at the student holistically outside of the classroom. And then the last trend that I want to talk about quickly is flexible learning spaces. So flexible learning spaces have been a trend for quite some time in the face-to-face -face classroom. Really looking at opening up our classrooms instead of having rigid rows and tiny desks, making space for students to engage in a variety of activities in the classroom so that our pedagogy can be more active and students can be more involved and more collaborative in those physical spaces. In the online environment, there's really no reason to stick to very traditional uh, faculty-focused teaching methods, although we tend to because those are a little bit easier to plan and, and structure. So to move to something more flexible, you could look to tools like Trello, which Tracy discussed, so that students can do more collaborative work and take more ownership for that. Or you might consider tools like Slack here at the front, that's S-L-A-C-K, which is a tool being used in a lot of high-tech startups, uh, say in Silicon Valley, where instead of using the traditional format we have now of email and files servers so that we can share documents and communicate, they use an integrated system of uh, instant messaging and file sharing so that we collaborate via conversation as opposed to um, more rigid structures. So in this sort of an environment, you as the faculty member become a facilitator and really the emphasis is on the students to engage and uh, collaborate. It isn't something that I've tried to teach with yet and I don't know of any cases particularly where uh, faculty are teaching with it, but it may be a tool for you to consider if you're trying to initiate more of a flexible open learning environment. I'm going to go ahead here and I want to highlight for those of you who are from NIU that uh, the foundation is offering, and really I believe it's the Committee for the Improvement of Undergraduate Instruction, uh, is undergraduate education, is offering the David Raymond Grant for the use of technology in teaching. This is a small grant, I believe it's $1,000, and it's meant to encourage faculty to develop or make innovative use of technology in teaching. Uh, Mr. Raymond was the one of the first members of our Board of Trustees here at NIU and was very uh, committed to growing the use of technology in teaching. So if you're interested in that, I would go to go.niu.edu slash Raymond2016 or click the link that Tracy provided in the text chat. The deadline to submit is rapidly approaching, uh, so I would do that soon. If you, would be in, if you have an idea for using technology and you would like some uh, assistance to do so. February 29th. Thank you, Tracy. I am now going to turn things back over to Tracy so she can wrap us up. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an exciting time to be in education from the standpoint of emerging technologies. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, just in summary, we've talked about um, some ways to create content, enhance communication and collaboration, um, definitely becoming more student-centered, and hopefully you've discovered some new educational technology trends. Uh, thanks again for joining us. We will be sending out a follow-up email um, with information on how to find the archive and um, a short survey uh, to give us your feedback. So again, thank you. We will hang out for just a couple minutes if anybody has any um, questions. Thank you all, too. You are welcome.